Hello, everybody. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. This week we read Parshat Sav, Parsha that details the sacrifices, the Kolbanot. We started already last week with the Kolbanot, but this week we're getting into the details, into the nitty gritty. So I want to step back a second. But the whole idea, talk about the whole idea of sacrifices. Before we get into the details, do you see this poor animal being burnt on the altar? Yeah. Does, does that make you feel closer to God? Do you think the person who brings this animal and kills it and slaughters it and offers it, do you, do you feel it now, now closer to God or further away from God? It seems so foreign to us today. Yet our Parsha is filled with all the details of sacrifices and they're commanded to bring sacrifices. So the question is why? Does God need these animals to be slaughtered? Do the Israelites need it for some psychological reason? Does it serve some other purpose? Yeah, better than people. Ah, which is so what they did back then. So wean them away from human sacrifices. I like that explanation very much. We're going to see something along those lines. Along those lines, we're going to see a great machlokis, a great disagreement between medieval commentators. Let's talk a little bit about the linguistic aspect. Um, what's the Hebrew word for sacrifice? Oh, maybe you don't see it. Let me hide this. Korban. Um, Korban, yeah. Korban, right. And the root of Koban is is what? Karev. Karov. Karov. Close. Very good. And in fact, the first opening verse of Vayikra, or the second verse, it has those two verbs, the verb and the noun. So the Hebrew reads, Daber el b'nei Yisrael v'amotarehem. Adam ki akriv mikem korban l'adonai. You have the verb brings near one, when one among you brings near, and then the, the noun, koban, near offering. So Professor Fox, he likes to, as much as possible, stay close to the Hebrew. And when the Hebrew has a play of words or has two, two uh, roots that is, offers two different words, he likes to keep it in English. So that's why uh, he, the, he used the verb brings near to show you that in the Hebrew, it's the same root, yakriv koban. So the word koban is because you bring the animal near the altar, or you bring it near God, so to speak, to, to the tabernacle, to the place where it's offered. So the animal is coming close, right? Not, not the person necessarily who brought it, but the animal is now close to the sanctuary. It's actually on the altar of the, of the sanctuary where you know, God just dwells, so to speak. But we know that in modern Hebrew, there's another meaning to the word koban. What's the other meaning? A victim. Sacrifice. Excellent. A victim. So what's the connection? You see, sacrifice and victim. In modern Hebrew, a victim of a crime, a victim of a, oh, I want to dedicate, dedicate our class today to the six victims of that freak accident in the bridge in Baltimore. The, the workers who work so hard so that we can drive on those bridges and they paid with their lives uh, when that ship collided with the key bridge. So I want to dedicate it to their memory. So they were, right, we talk about they were victims of, of this terrible accident that happened. So how, how did that uh, additional meaning, because you can imagine, right, in the, in, in the Bible, that, that doesn't mean a victim, the word Koban. So I looked up the etymology of the word and it's very interesting how they broadened the meaning of this word. Originally, it was just sacrifices, animals brought. So here's a excellent dictionary, Milon Sapir. Uh, it's milononline.net, if you want to ever use it. And uh, he says here, when you click the bar, etymology, um, so he explains there's two meanings. And I wanted to show you also how Google Translate can help today. If you're not so familiar with the with the Hebrew, you put the, you you copy this whole sentence and you put it in Google Translate, it comes out pretty good, pretty well. 
So the first meaning is an expression of desire to get closer to God. That's the original biblical meaning. And also because they would bring the animal closer to the altar. But then the modern meaning are ex meanings are expansion and a borrowing, meaning a broadening. They borrowed it to, me to, to, other, to, to other meanings, referring to the animal itself, which becomes a reluctant victim. So now the focus is on the poor animal. We already see in the use of the word that those who coined the term koban for victim were very well aware and, and sensitive that this poor animal is being forced to be burnt on the altar. And it's, it is actually a victim. And so they said, let's use that word now to denote any victim, including human victims. So today, basically, it's, it's only, uh, I guess you could also have an animal victim, um, but... Uh, mostly, in when talking about the meaning of victim, uh, it's a human person who was a, a victim. And so that came because already in the modern times, we felt that this is unfair to the animal. No, nobody asked the animal whether it wants to be brought as a sacrifice. So that's an interesting linguistic point. So now I want to go back to um, our discussion. And so we saw there were two meanings. And uh, I still feel, again, I'm going to make that point again, that this actually causes us, when we see all these animals being killed and slaughtered, uh, it makes us far from God, the hook. And to call it Koban, something close, is more like a euphemism. And maybe a better name would be Rachkan, which means you know to go far, to go far away from God. So that begs the question, so why all this focus on sacrifices? So a historical note uh, first, uh, from ancient time among the, the, the Jewish communities, it was customary to start teaching kids in the Talmud Torah and the Cheder. From which book? What do you think? Kayikra. Yes. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Isn't that counterintuitive? You would think it'd start from Bereshit. But no, yeah. they started from Vayikra. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, in Haredi communities, they might still do that today. A uh, mother, maybe you can ask uh, Baruch San if, if his children, they started. And this is based on a, uh, a, a Talmudic Midrash. Why, why you start the kids, you know, the first year in Cheder, you start them from Vayikra, where all these sacrifices, all this blood, and all this. So, said Rav Asi, why do children begin their studies from Torah Kohani, which is another name for the book of Vayikra, and not from Bereshit? Because children are pure and the sacrifices are pure. Let the pure come and occupy themselves with the pure. What do you think of that reasoning? Is it convincing? Not at all. Uh, I agree that it's not convincing at all. Uh, I think they never actually did sacrifice. It explains how Talmudic rabbis could make that statement. What is pure about all these slaughtering and blood sprinkling? And what's pure about that? I, I agree. There's no pure, moon. Pure, but I think there's no moon. Go ahead. There's no moon. There's no blemish. The animal can't have a blemish. In that sense, it's pure. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, I see what you're saying. There's no moon. There's That's, no blemish. The, Ah, the regulation. Okay. Yeah, in that sense. Okay. Children young age, they haven't, you know, they haven't sinned yet, and the animal has no blemish. I see the connection. Uh, but in terms of, of starting them off with this, uh, first of all, it's not very interesting. So I don't know how you would get them to continue to be interested in Torah study if all their studying is on the different laws, and this animal you eat part of it, and this animal you don't eat anything, and this is how you sprinkle the blood. And I, I don't see how that would fascinate them. Uh, I think the stories of Bereshit are more fascinating, but also in terms of, of, uh, I think the people who wrote this midrash never actually slaughtered an animal. Never actually saw. I mean, we know they, they this is post, post uh, temple period, so they never actually saw the gory details of sacrifices, and so they can write such a midrash. But this actually was historically uh, true in many, many, many communities. Where they started kids. Now, the advantage is you don't have all the licentiousness that you find in Bereshit, right? Think about that. So you don't have all the salacious 
stories that we find in Bereshit with a lot of violence and sex that uh, so in, in a sense maybe that could be also a reason in terms of pure okay it also um it, it's a, a show of power to the little kids and uh might frighten them which that may have been behind some of that thinking you know blood and knives and you know kid you better behave or yeah. ah, you're next. yeah 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 <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's see the Rambam here. The Rambam in the Guide for the Perplexed has a lengthy discussion. Why? Well, we're now we're going to get to the crux of the matter. Why? Why offer sacrifices? Why did God command them? So do we have a volunteer to read the Rambam? Okay, it is namely impossible to go suddenly from one extreme to the other, it is therefore, according to the nature of man, impossible for him suddenly to discontinue everything to which he has been accustomed. Now God sent Moses to make the Israelites a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay, continue. But the custom which was in those days general among all men and the general mode of worship in which the Israelites were brought up consisted in sacrificing animals in those temples which contained certain images to bow down to those images and to burn incense before them. Religious and ascetic persons were in those days, the persons that were devoted to the service in the temples erected to the stars as has been explained by us. It was in accordance with the wisdom and plan of God as displayed in the whole creation that he did not command us to give up and to discontinue all these manners of service is there one more page for this reason god allowed these kinds of service to continue he transferred to his service that which had formerly served as a worship of created beings and of things imaginary and unreal and commanded us to serve him in the same manner to build unto him a temple to have the altar erected in his name to offer the sacrifices to him to bow down to him and to burn incense before him. Okay, thank you. Hooray for Rambam. He understood the historical context of our ancestors. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, But there also, there was human sacrifice. He's, Rambam's talking about animal. I mean, right. if you look yeah. if you look at the Akeda, there it is. You know, that's, right. it, yeah. don't, so. Yeah, yeah. There had to be some kind of physical, yeah physical uh, some physical connection with the 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 uh the higher higher being and that was this service yes and it was impossible to command them to cease altogether it, yeah it's so it's so prevalent it's how everybody else is worshiping right yeah and now let's see a different opinion and then we're going to ask a Nehama style question Last week, my mother did it uh, and gave me, inspired me to, to do the same. So we'll see now Nachmanides, Ramban, but not only uh, Nachmanides from the Middle Ages, who the 13th century, but also Radatz Hoffman or Rabbi David Svi Hoffman, who is a 20th century commentator. Um, he, they, this is a different opinion now. Let's read him. Any volunteer to read Nachmanides and Radatz Hoffman? So I'll read this one. The real significance of the sacrifice may be gauged from Abraham's offering. He had withstood nine divine trials and was confronted by the severest, the sacrifice of his only son. After he displayed his readiness and implicit obedience to the divine behest, was he bidden to offer a substitute? What was the substitute? The ram. Mm -hmm. The ram, the ram. right. Yes. This clearly indicates that the animal sacrifice symbolizes complete surrender to the will of the Almighty. Fear of God implies wholehearted obedience to his dictates. Mm. So now, Nechama would ask, tell me the difference between Maimonides and Nachmanides and Hoffman in, in a few words. In other words, don't repeat, Maimonides said this, Nachmanides said that. Try and, and a zero in on what is the main difference between the two methods, with the two explanations. How would you explain in a few words? It doesn't have to be one word. 
what is the main difference between that long that long essay that we read from from Maimonides and the guide and the one we just read the Maimonides, this one here I, I their view of human nature okay explain further well they uh you know the Ramban believes that human beings have enough a strong enough will and self-control that they can um, have the level of obedience that Avraham showed. Uh, I think Ram Baum does not believe that and believes that people have to be uh, brought to something step by step. Okay, okay. And, and in terms of positive, negative, so I want to even shorten the difference to say in like two words. The, the, the sacrifices are in Mahmadi's view X and in Ahmadi's view Y. The, How about is, this? Maimonides exogenous, Ramban Nach, Nech, Nachmanides endogenous. Mm. Maimonides is looking outside of Judaism or the children of Israel, Nachmanides uh, is looking inside an in internal. Okay. Yeah, person. yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. So both answers are very good. I phrased it a little differently. Uh, I read it in her book, so I, I cheated. I, uh, <laughs> according to Maimonides, the whole idea of sacrifice is a preventative measure, no inherent value. There's even a word we use in Talmudic parlance called bedieved. It's a concession to the human weakness. Uh, so it's along your lines, Natalie. It's, it's, there's a weakness, and God can see. Doesn't, doesn't really want it. There's no value in it. If somehow we can overcome that human weakness to offer sacrifices, then God doesn't want it at all. The Humanities takes issue with that. No, there is inherent value. It is a positive means of communicating with the divine. It's not a concession to our human weaknesses. There's inherent value. It's uh, the way he, uh, if we go back, um, it indicates complete surrender to the will of the Almighty. So there's there's value in bringing these animals. It's complete surrender. So we see we saw two opposing views uh, of of the of the sacrifices. Uh, now let me ask you: Who was the first person to offer sacrifices? I'll show you a picture. Abraham. Even before, no, it was before. It was either Cain or Abel. Oh, it was uh, Abel. Ah, wait. Okay. Uh, I didn't include him because uh, it doesn't say the word altar. Okay, so I want to ask. I'll phrase it differently. You're right. No, I. I. Uh, okay, who was the first person to build an altar and Noah. offer sacrifices? Noah. Noah. Yeah. There you go. Do you see a picture? That or you don't. Oh, yeah, I see a picture. But now yeah. I, I see the elephant. Yeah. Animal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh let's think about him as the first person who brought sacrifices on an altar, who you know it says specifically that he built an altar and, and offered them. Now, what does that which opinion does that support? What do you think? Does that support more Maimonides' view or Nachmanides' view? And oh, let's read how it happened. Let's read how it happened. Was there a command there, or did he do it on his own? Let's uh, read like the just just two verses. So the flood ends. He comes out. Noah came out together with all his wife and sons, and all the animals come out. And then verse twenty. Then Noah built an altar to Adonai, and taking every pure animal and every pure bird, he offered them burnt offerings on the altar. Does that support Maimonides' view of sacrifices or Nachmanides? What do you think? It depends on whether people in Noah's time were doing animal sacrifices they, before yeah. the flood. Right. Whether right. That was well, his... right. So I think, I think uh, along what you're saying, since there was no command here, he just saw what everybody else was doing, or he remembered. He, now, now there's no person living except for him. 
right, according to the story, but at least he probably remembers uh, what happened before, and he does this of his own volition. You see, there's no mm -hmm. command. The, right. the flood ends, the flood ends. God does command him to go out. God could have said, now bring sacrifices. No. God just says, God spoke to Noah, come out, uh, bring the animals out. God mentions the animals, but then out of his own volition, Vayive Noah. Then Noah built an altar. So I think, like Gary said, it's it's human nature to do it at that time, in that era. If this was something with inherent value that God wants us to do, where is the command? You would expect the command to do it. But yeah. Noah, out of his yeah. own, right, very totally voluntary, nobody asked him to do this, and he builds the altar and he and he makes the sacrifices. I think that supports Rambam, uh, right. Maimonides. Okay. Okay. Shammai, the artist, uh, obviously didn't read the Torah. Look at the, look at the animals; they are hardly pure. Oh yes, <laughs> I, I haven't heard of you know elephants and lions being sold in Shalom. Or aren't they just <laughs> observers there? You know, they're... No, they're they're the next in line. No, she's right. Oh, they're next in line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I I think uh, my mind doesn't bring that, but I think that would support. His opinion, the, the story of Noah. So now let's get into more details. So we talked more broadly, but now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of the sacrifices. We have three basic types, and what are the what are the ideas that we can uh, gain from these sacrifices today? Just the ideas as we discuss them. So we have the Ola, the burnt offering. We have the Shlamim, from the word Shalem or Shalom, so it may be called peace offering or wholeness offering. And finally, we have the chatat offering, the sin offering. So we're going to play a game. You know how in the newspapers they often have what are the differences and they show you two pictures and you have to find all these small differences. So we're going to do something similar. So with regarding to the ola offering, the burnt offering, the one that goes up on the altar, that's why it's ola, ole, like an aliyah, to have an aliyah. All the meat is consumed by fire. The Kohanim cannot eat from it. The owner cannot eat from it. It goes totally uh, burnt on the altar. Then the Shlamim is actually shared by three parties. The Shlamim is shared by the owner of the animal. So he gets to eat dinner from that from the animal that he brought. The Kohanim, they get their dinner. And some parts of the animal are burnt. So, so to speak, God uh, partakes in this uh uh, in the offering, in the Shlamim offering. So we have three parties that share this the, the Shlamim offering. Oh. Then we have the Chatat, the sin offering. There, the meat, some of it is burnt on the altar, and some of it is eaten exclusively by the Kohanim. The owner does not get to eat from the sin offering. And so now looking at this, if 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 I were to ask you, if you were to, to come before, testify before a committee that thinks about returning to sacrifices, bringing sacrifices again, and they said to you, we decided there was going to be only one type of sacrifice. And what is your opinion? Which should we have? Okay, so even if you don't think that, that you don't think there should be any sacrifices, but they tell you, we, we've decided already. There's going to be one, and we want your opinion, which is the one most palatable to you? Which one would you pick? The peace, because you're wasting least amount of animal absolutely mm -hmm. i think we would all agree shlamim that's the most or the least cruel out of the three because you're feeding as many more people with with this korban with this with this okay so that's that's sort of the the easiest to explain and i think the most difficult to explain is the ola where it's just totally burnt on the altar so now we're going to, just for a few minutes, uh, we're going to have to start. I, I like the Ola. Oh, why? Because then I have no material benefit from it. It's all all uh, emotional or psychological with my relation with Hashem. Ah, interesting. Interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So it's complete, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't get any, any benefit. Uh, no ulterior motive. I see. Right. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, 
we'll start watching uh, um, the ideas. Each each one of these sacrifices has sort of an energy associated with it, and it has corresponding commandments that we do have for, uh, these days that can be associated with them. So while we're not going to bring this back to sacrifices, and uh, I think that would be a terrible mistake if anybody's thinking about it, but we can definitely still learn and get the energy from these three different types of of sacrifices. I I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, historically, I don't I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, my question is, when when you brought an olah, how did the kohanim get paid? They're clearly paid in the other two. Hmm. Ah, so there would have to be an assumption that others that, that during the, in that day, uh, uh, other people would bring the shlamim and chatad that day so they could have something to eat. There would be an assumption that, in other words, you're right. If all if all the people brought were Allah on a certain day, they'd be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think they. Um, I mean, everybody sins. We all do sins. So I think it's pretty safe to say that there were always people bringing <laughs> the, the yellow mm -hmm. one uh, so that they mm -hmm. could eat their dinner. The Kohanim can have some meat. Uh, shlamim, the, actually, there's two subcategories with the peace or wholeness. There's one called Shalmei Toda, bringing it as a Thanksgiving offering. So somebody who had a miraculous event, um, recovered from a very serious sickness or traversed the desert and survived it, um, then they would bring this shlavim sacrifice. The other one would be a voluntary, just somebody who has a lot of money and feels like they want to bring uh, an animal to the to the to the uh, sanctuary, and it's called shamei nedava. That not related to any particular event, but voluntary. So, uh, what about an asham? And, and Hashem also, is very similar to Hatat. Yeah, so I didn't keep, I didn't make it its own category, but you're right. There's yeah. also uh, the third one, the Hatat. Actually, I would say maybe Hatat slash Asham, because uh, it's just it's just different other types of sins. So for these types yeah. of sins, you bring a Hatat, and for other types of sins, you bring an Asham. But it's the same yeah. idea. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see. We have oh, just two minutes. So let's start, and then we'll continue next week. Uh, it's a very great um, video that can learn, uh, can make sense out of these sacrifices. Or make sense, what are the ideas behind them? So what I'd like to do with you is examine these offerings in terms of a few different criteria. First of all, what are the laws of the offerings? Who partakes of the offering? Two, what are the names of the offering? What do we make of the names themselves? And see, where are the precedents for the offering? When is the earliest times that we have an example of this kind of offering? So let's start with chatat. Think back to the very first sin. That was the eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it's kind of interesting if you think about that sin, is that sin actually involved sort of illegal consumption on the part of people. We ate something we weren't supposed to eat, and then in this chatat we actually give back something to be eaten by Kohanim, who are sort of representing the divine here. As a matter of fact, if you go back to some of our Parsha videos, they even talk about the Mishkan as a kind of human recreation of the garden. The comparison becomes even more striking. When we were in God's garden the first time, we transgressed and we ate this stuff. And now here we are and we're giving food to be eaten, essentially, back to representatives of God in this new garden, in this <clears throat> Mishkan. There seems to be a kind of tit-for-tat here. Think about what a transgression is. You can think about that word to transgress. The English words trans means to cross over a line. It kind of suggests that involved in any transgression is a kind of line crossing, a kind of boundary crossing. We think of the world, almost a map of the world. Boundaries are part of the way we think about it. You know, sometimes those are natural boundaries, but often they're political boundaries. We would only imagine that you and me were in the world. We would imagine that part of the world is going to be my domain and part of the world is going to be your domain. We draw a line separating our domains. But now let me ask you a kind of funny question. Thinking about us and thinking about God, would you say there's anything in the world that's sort of God's domain? And would you say there's anything that's our domain? 
So going back to the garden, there's sort of a very simple answer to that. You know, God created us and he put us in this garden and he said, here's your domain. Here's all these trees and from all the trees of the garden, you shall surely eat. But there's one tree, the tree of good and evil, that I don't want you to eat from. That's my domain. That's my tree. Of course, the very first transgression was the transgression, the crossing over of that boundary. When we cross over a boundary improperly, so we've sort of violated that boundary, a violation of a boundary would say is a lack of respect, respect of the territorial integrity of someone else. I ask for a certain kind of basic respect, which is that you leave my things alone. We ask for that in our human relations. And in relationships between us and God, it's no different. The least God can ask from us, really, is respect. Here's my tree, please don't eat my tree. To go eat from God's tree is a lack of respect. It's a transgression. And the way we atone for it is when we inadvertently transgress in that kind of way. So we say, look, the least I think I can do is, is to give you something from my domain and offer that to the Kohanim. So the Kohanim consume the Chatat, the sin offering. Now, going back to the... Okay, so let's summarize just that, and then we'll end. So the... What are the characteristics of this khatat? So he said transgression and uh, lack of respect for domain, for, for the domain of the other. Mm -hmm. And so the key word here will be respect. The energy, the vibe that this offering is about is about respect lack of respect maybe we'll highlight it um so i think he explained was uh quite convincing that so that can explain why the owner doesn't get to eat anything he he transgressed he crossed over into the domain of hashem by making some transgression some some sin now he has to completely let god sort of get into his domain and take that animal from him and he doesn't get to eat anything from it the the owner who brought the animal right the kohanim can still eat they are sort of representatives of god okay so that will be the key word lack of respect that is typical of the satat offering that's the energy of this offering and we'll stop here and the next week we'll continue what is the energy of shlamim and what is the energy of ola all right okay. so thank you all thank you okay. thank you thank you Sure. Thank you.